This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. There are a few books that you read over the years that really stick with you, whose message seems timeless, but at the same time completely relevant to today. For me, one of those books is The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman. The book is a deep look at the early days of World War I, how quickly a man being shot on the streets of Sarajevo would pick up geopolitical steam and lead to the breaking of Europe. And in the book, Tuckman almost gives you the impression that these great powers weren't originally seeking out an all-encompassing war, that it was a series of pre-existing symptoms and a handful of bad decisions that pushed these empires to simply sleepwalk into the war to end all wars. In the years leading up to World War I, Europe was simply piling powder kegs on top of each other, not realizing the magnitude of what they were doing. Well, that was until one Serbian match blew up the whole of Europe. This is a lesson that I think we see again today, not between Austria and Serbia, but between two major competitors for the leadership of the North African states, Algeria and Morocco. Both states have been fighting via proxy for years in Western Sahara, and both sides have been building up their forces recently. The relations are worsening, and the internal political situation inside both of these countries is destabilizing. With each passing month, more and more powder kegs are being added to that pile. With the tensions at the levels they are, it only takes a small miscommunication, a misjudging of a stunt, a military accident that you can't admit to without losing face. That's all it takes for things to go terribly wrong. And much like the First World War, both sides have international partners. Both sides are crucial in keeping a lid on counter-terrorism operations in the Sahel, and both sides sit right on the doorstep of Europe. So will this lead to a war? How did we get here? And will Algeria and Morocco be able to pull back before someone lights a match? Well, for all that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Retreading the Past I would say that it's a very large country geographically and demographically. Uh, the population has been growing. Uh, it got multiplied by three within, I would say, 30 years or a little bit more. It's also big historically. It has a whole set of symbolic missions to fulfill. The pressure on its shoulders because of what it has meant over the last 60 years is, is quite big. And yeah, of course, uh, from an economic perspective, a ridiculously small amount of uh, diversification, which uh, creates a, a very tough moment for, for, for itself. Jalel Hadri is a senior fellow at Global Initiative, specializing in Libya, Algeria, and North Africa. He's been published in a wide range of geopolitical papers, and we're very happy to have him back on the show today. So this doesn't mean that it doesn't have a foreign policy. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have problems that are authentic and genuine with its neighbors. It doesn't mean that it's completely in the business of fabricating all of its uh, foreign policy crises. So yes, it is true that the main problem is internal, but it's not the only problem. So uh, it's, it's all, always useful to not be dismissive and, and be able to kind of see how also other other neighbors whether it's european neighbors or arab neighbors or african neighbors can also have an incentive to lie and and distort things so uh, we have to kind of respect the complexity of, of of the country it's a big country and it's not talked about very often so it's very easy to distort things and and fabricate all kinds of uh threats that do not really exist and in order to deflect attention from the real one. History seems to matter a great deal in Algeria, with the media consistently talking about their colonial struggles and the civil war, probably more than any other nation in the region. Why is the historical narrative so prevalent in Algeria? Well, first of all, there is something uh, relatively unique about its history. Uh, the success that the independentist, nationalist, Algerians uh, were able to achieve 
in 1962 was a little bit more than what most observers were expecting. And it's also, importantly, more than the actual actors were hoping for. So that class of winners, and, we, and it's a very specific group of people belonging to a very specific generation, have been largely in power for the last 60 years. So they are just dying now. So it's the same physical people. So it's not really the past. Those people are still around. And they started showing signs of, of mortality and weakness only very recently. One of the major parts of this story is the building decades of tensions between Algeria and Morocco, with both competing to be the hegemon of the region effectively. Where do these tensions start and why are they so distraught between the two countries? Well, the underlying problem is uh, of great simplicity. Uh, it's largely geographic in nature, and it goes back to this event that I keep referring to, um, the, uh, the peace accords of, of March 1962, the Evian Accord. So this, this sudden uh, capitulation by France, the fact that France lost everything in terms of territory. Um, and to make a long story short, it basically gave birth to an Algeria that was large. It was very, very large compared to the populated area or the area that, that actually under, um, underwent the, 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 the physical struggle. So the, the resulting monster, geographic monster in terms of its sheer size, uh, was was the origin of, of this problem with, with Morocco. Because as long as France was there, then then there was an acceptance on the part of Morocco. But when, when France basically left in 1962, then it kind of uh, rekindled this ideology uh, on the part of Morocco, which is a completely normal thing to have. I mean, every self-respecting country has a dream of being, being bigger, uh, from from a territorial perspective, especially when when the the order that has just collapsed is very very old and very arbitrary from a historical perspective. So uh, in 1963, Morocco, uh, who who already had this ideology of a greater Morocco, thought very rationally and very correctly that it was a moment of weakness that had to be seized as an opportunity to uh, grab a little bit more territory on, uh, from, from the western part of the northwestern part of, of Algeria. So that gave rise to this short war that occurred in, um, in 1963. And then they have another big event, which is similar to the departure of France, is the departure of, of the Spaniards from Western Sahara. Uh, in 1975, and so that that basically had the same effect. You know, the Europeans are leaving, so Morocco saw uh, in that moment, uh, quite rationally, again, uh, an occasion, an opportunity to um, to seize a huge amount of, of territory to to its south, and uh, and Algeria, of course, saw it as a threat. And again, this is you don't need uh, a lot of ideology to explain these. Uh, very crucial steps that I'm trying to describe. It, of course, there are different cultures. You have a monarchy in, in Morocco. You have a very republican, very socialistic um, culture that emerged from, from the, the war of independence in, in Algeria. So you, you do have different cultures. You, have, you do have a, a very individual history on, on each side. But, but the fundamental problem is uh, very arithmetic and very geographic. And this was a big blow to France as well, with Paris actually viewing Algeria as part of France proper, the same way that Normandy or Champagne would be. But the tensions with Algeria were not just with France or with Morocco. There is a pretty steep divide inside Algeria between the Algerians who live in the big cities along the North Mediterranean coast and the Berbers who live in the vast southern deserts. Uh, can you take us through this divide and explain it a bit for us? Well, you know, when I was talking about the size, of course, I was including all of it, but um, but I was particularly referring to efforts that Paris uh, initiated a little bit late. I'm talking about the period between 1957 and 1962. There was an effort to kind of, you know, prepare for like set up a, a safety net of some sort. And uh, what Paris started doing was try to 
sell the Sahara as an internationalized territory, saying, you know, of course, we're going to collectivize this territory. It has nothing to do with Algeria. And the independentists of the Algerians will, if they win, of course, they're not going to win. God forbid they win. But if they do win, then they will win only the, this strip of land uh, by, by the coast. Um, and that plan B was set up too timidly and too, too, and, and too late. And um, the final result, of, of the capitulation of France in 1962 is that the Algeria that emerged included the Sahara. Uh, and of course, it included the Western, this, this Tindouf to Tlemcen strip of land that you're referring to, which is by, by the uh, Moroccan border, and it includes also uh, Kabylia. And, and with, with, when it comes to the western, the northwestern part of Algeria, of course, you know, some people will say, well, there's no natural border. Well, is there a natural border in Alsace-Lorraine? You know, is there a natural border in the Pays Basque? These southern Algerians and Tuaregs who regularly move around the vast Sahara Desert don't always adhere to the incredibly porous borders between Algeria, Mauritania, Mali, and Niger. The desert areas between them was once the homelands of groups like the Tuaregs, but now with colonial borders means that these groups are now split across many of these nations. And in some cases, these groups are fighting to try and pull away from the country they've been lumped in with. But to add to all of these problems, there are even more fundamental disasters for Algeria. The biggest and most glaring being the stagnant and crumbling Algerian economy. But why has the Algerian economy been so weak for so long now? So when it comes to true value, value added, it has a few activities here and there, but it's tiny compared to what it should have been. Uh, knowing the very comfortable, easy periods that it went through. So the first very easy period that it went through was the 70s because of the 1973 and the 1979 oil shocks. Algeria was just swimming in money, right? didn't use it. Didn't use it to uh, build an economy, the, to, to acquire expertise or uh, any kind of ability to produce value added and and and, uh, and and become independent from from a very basic gesture that consists in extracting hydrocarbons and selling them and, and being completely dependent on international oil prices. That's not an economy. That that doesn't take you anywhere because your your population grows, you consume more and more, and it leads to, to you crashing into a wall at some stage. And that's fundamentally the problem. It went through another very easy, very pleasant period that it didn't use at all for the sake of actually acquiring a true industrial fabric or, or any kind of you know, non-oil dependent economy. It was a period from 2000 and 2014. So this is like the super cycle um, super cycle in commodity prices. So because of China, because of all kinds of things, uh, oil prices just kept going up and up and up um, in terms of trend. And uh, so, you know, it was consuming much less than it was making. And there was this extra amounts of dollars that were being produced ev every year. And uh, it was a unique, absolutely, you know, invaluable opportunity to finally do the right thing and and invest in in its own ability to generate value added but it didn't do it because of corruption because and that's i think the main legacy of of Botflika. Uh the net result is today uh algeria is still almost 100 percent dependent on international oil prices and its ability to produce is you know um, dwindling slowly for two reasons, because the reserves are, are being consumed, but also because the population uh, is growing and it's, and it's a population that consumes a lot, a lot of electricity, a lot of food, wastes a lot. So all of that, you know, kind of eats into this uh, decreasing amount of hydrocarbons that is effectively the only source of hard currency for, for the nation. So it's better to think of it as a country that doesn't have an economy at all. Uh, it's harsh judgment, but it's simpler to view it that way. 
And uh, now that it's caught into this moment when it actually eats into its hard currency reserves uh, that were built up during the 2000s, uh, it, it has no extra leeway to invest in, in anything or diversify. It's just too late. It doesn't have any room for maneuver. And it's a very complicated, slow process. You know, you, you need at least, you know, even if you're like super lucky like and, and super talented like the Chinese, you need at least 30 years. So when is it going to happen? Um, and so the population is not used to the level of suffering that they will have to go through if the current trend uh, persists, and I think it will persist. Um, and, and of course, the, the hard currency reserves will... Uh, will be depleted within the next year or two. And at that moment, even if the president just a couple of days ago said that uh, the nation will not resort to, to external debt, the nation will resort to external debt because that's the only game in town. So maybe it won't, it won't happen through the IMF. Maybe it will happen through some kind of a deal with the Gulf states. Maybe it will happen through a very opaque arrangement with China. But at the end of the day, it will be end up being uh, a form of debt. And uh, so once you're there, of course, the leeway that, that was describing as too narrow will, will shrink even further. And, and, um, and the nation will not be able to, to alter its economy, which is absent. And, and hydrocarbon reserves will continue dwindling. So it's a very grim um, scenario that I'm describing. But I mean, of course, there's always a, the, the Lebanon uh, possibility hanging on Algeria. Maybe it will happen within five years. Maybe it will happen within 10 years. Maybe it will be avoided. And, and of course, what Lebanon is going through is a collapse. But in the very short term, I think it's better to think of uh, a population that is already disgruntled because of political reasons. And that population busy complaining correctly about corruption, about political um, lack of, of, of diversity and, and, and dynamism will end up struggling with an, a third source of suffering that it has seen only a part of so far. I mean, that, that kind of suffering will just uh, get multiplied. So instead of having a decreasing number of problems, the population will end up suffering much more. And, and so it could, it could end up looking like death by a, a thousand paper, paper cuts. We have seen huge protests against the government and this situation over the last few years. And the situation is continuing to spiral downwards. So you think we're likely to see these protests intensify and build up, even with the possibility of an internal revolution within Algeria over the next few years? I mean, the business of predicting revolutions is uh, notoriously futile um you know nobody can do that by by the very nature of the beast i mean you cannot predict that of course is it is it a young population is it an angry population yes is it a, a population that could turn out to be explosive yes but yeah i'm not gonna try i'm not gonna try to predict anything because it demonstrated very recently that it's capable of uh, confounding any kind of predictions, like what happened in 2019, the way the 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 young of Algeria, this, it was mostly the young, not only the young, but let's say the Algerian population writ large, what it did was absolutely remarkable because it was able to convey uh, an extraordinary amount of, of anger and frustration without resorting to vandalism, without uh, utilizing any form of violence, uh, by demonstrating a, a you know a, a great amount of patience, maybe too much patience. Sometimes some people are even making fun of him because of that patient uh, facet. So there have been large protests against the government now for years, but one of the closest and most tense moment for the government was in 2019. Uh, could you take us through that? Well, again, you have to. Like everything you've heard about Algeria has been in the political arena. Um, the Herak movement is a discourse, is an attitude, it's a preoccupation that spends very little time on the actual economic problems of, of the nation. 
And when they speak about corruption, of course corruption is, is a bane. Of course it, it has tremendous consequences, but it's still a political problem. And in terms of GDP, um, it, of course, it, as I said, it, it generates consequences that are felt over, over decades, but it's, uh, you take a snapshot of a country, you, you know, the corruption is not a, an economic problem. It's, the, the economic problem is that you, you're, you know, that your dependency on, 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 on the ability to eat into your uh, foreign exchange reserves from a few years prior. You know, why are you spending more than you're generating in terms of income? You know, uh, how come you're not able to attract foreign investors when it comes to increasing your capacity to extract hydro hydrocarbons? You know, how come you don't have an industry? How come you have a lobby uh, all, all kinds of special interests that are actively committed to making sure that Algeria doesn't acquire the ability to manufacture anything internally. Because those people, of course, have an incentive to maximize imports, which is the last thing that the nation needs. Those are the true economic problems. And Herak doesn't, it's just vaguely aware of these things, but that's not in the, the forefront in terms of their concerns and in terms of their rhetoric. Um, Herak basically uh, was triggered by this crazy, when, when you look at it in hindsight, the crazy decision to uh, have Abdelaziz Bouteflika, who had a, a seizure, a very bad seizure in 2013, and still managed to run and get re-elected in 2014. And there was a group of, of intellectuals in Algiers that were shocked by that, and they tried to protest. And I spoke to a lot of them, and, but 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 seeing the same decision being you know being replicated uh, in 2019 is was seemed like a crazy bet, and it was. And um, and and the, the expectation of the of the power system was that a part of itself was going to sabotage that decision. So if it if it like did enough purges internally in terms of going after the elites and making sure that everybody is on board then the population would, would accept. And what it, what turned out, what, what basically ended up happening in, in February 2019 is that the population, it, wasn't, it didn't even begin in the large cities, it didn't begin in Algiers, but it was really the, the most ordinary sectors of the population that revolted, and they revolted peacefully. Uh, and that was done in a way that was actually sufficient to make, to make sure that President Bouteflika would, would resign, which he did in early April 2019. And the Hirak, basically, the argument from, from that movement, which still exists, I mean, it's not dead. I mean, some people say that it's dead, but I disagree. Um, the, the argument is, is quite basic, is that they it expects, it wants, it demands a, a total renewal of, of the elite classes. So it wasn't just about making sure that Bouteflika and, and a few of his friends and alcoholites would would disappear, but really uh, somehow get an overall, uh, like a, 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 the whole system would be redone. And of course, it hasn't been redone. Uh, the army stepped in in April 2019. Uh, some businessmen that had been very visible uh, in the last few years of Bouteflika were sent to jail. They were humiliated and, and they were uh, destituted. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the system has has changed in a satisfactory manner. Arguably, it hasn't at all. Um, so, so this is the unresolved. I mean, I really want to underscore the very unresolved nature of the Herak versus system uh, situation. It's not it's, so. It's just it's in suspension, and and there's still a lot of frustration, a lot of disappointment. Uh, and and all of it is focused on on the political class without necessarily discussing the amount uh, the the amount of sacrifices that the population will have to make regardless of what happens because uh, because the, the measures to correct what has gone wrong over the last thirty years will take an additional thirty years or forty years so in terms of just the time horizon the population whether it succeeds in, in giving the right impulse to political life or not, will have to suffer economically on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's very little debate, to my taste, about that 
very harsh reality that again is not really up to discussion it's just going to happen because there's no time to or there's no way to avoid it uh you there's nothing you could do at this stage to avoid uh this what i think is this inevitable scenario whereby the population will have to eat less well and 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 rec- and receive you know and and receive less electricity and 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 enjoy a lesser amount of fuel subsidies all these things will have to happen whether the the nation goes through the IMF and the IMF is known for being overzealous when it comes to austerity and if you go through some other route you know through the arabs of the gulf or china that austerity will have to happen maybe it will look slightly different maybe it will it will it will seem like a different route ideologically but at the end of the day from a daily you know from from a, a very pedestrian perspective the population if it's so aware should be aware of this and should uh, decide that it's a, a sacrifice that needs to be made uh, rather sooner than later and that debate doesn't really exist and to me that's that's uh, something that i have to say if i'm asked to describe herak is herak is focused on a few very valid points but it's also um a way of looking at things that kind of you know avoids this other facet because i think the population has you know has been guilty to 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 some extent and i and i say this because i'm algerian and i'm allowed i'm entitled to 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 say so the population has enjoyed a lot of the gifts a lot of the handouts uh that characterize the uh, bouteflika years The foundations of Algeria are cracking, and everywhere you look, more problems seem to be popping up. Whether it's the build-up of Moroccan troops over the border, the losing battles in Western Sahara, the rapidly deteriorating situation on the southern border in Mali and Niger, fights with Berbers, fights with JNIM, new political fights with France itself. In every direction Algeria looks, there are simply more problems popping up. So what options does Algiers have? Is it possible to win a 10-front war? Well, to take a look at that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. The Powder Keg So Algerian involvement in counterterrorism dates back uh, 30 years uh, to the onset of a civil war uh, in 1992. And very quickly that conflict turned into a conflict between a ruthless domestic security service on one side and a a largely Islamic opposition, which came to be dominated by uh, Islamic extremists, militants who themselves eventually became connected to al-Qaeda and even the Islamic State. That uh, dirty war diminished substantially during the period of uh, former President Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Uh, Bouteflika's two amnesties diminished uh, the ranks of the militants quite a bit. Uh, But there, to this day, are still some extremists still operating inside Algeria. uh, And they uh, moved eventually as well into Mali in part of an organization called Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, And that AQIM developed ties later to the Islamic State uh, in the Middle East, in the Mashraq. Robert Ford is the former U.S. ambassador to Algeria, as well as a current senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and a professor at Yale University. Robert was also the U.S. State Department lead in Syria, the deputy U.S. ambassador in Iraq, and the chief of mission in Bahrain. And we are very happy to have Robert on the show today. The Algerians have, uh, their domestic security services have continued to fight against those militant groups, sometimes with success. Uh, Occasionally, the militants have a a success. When I was ambassador in Algeria, they bombed uh, the office building in downtown Algiers where the prime minister sits. They also destroyed the United Nations uh, office in Algiers. Uh, Those attacks were in 2007 and 2008. Uh, The Algerians have now begun to cooperate uh, quite a bit with the United States um, and with some other uh, 
foreign states security services, in particular um, Tunisia, uh, less so with Morocco, frankly. Um, and it's kind of an ongoing battle uh, between these Islamic uh, militants and uh, security forces in places like Mali and Algeria. Of course, the Algerians work with the Malians as well. Do you think Algeria will be on the front foot when it comes to terrorist groups in the region, you know, sending soldiers to go fight groups like JNIM where they originate in Mali rather than waiting for them to get to Algeria? First, I think it's important for the listeners to understand we're not talking about the Algerians sending big army forces. Uh, this is not a repeat of an American intervention uh, in a place like Iraq or um, Afghanistan. The Algerians don't operate on anything like uh, that kind of scale or that kind of operation. Um, it's much, much, much smaller. It's usually um, uh, intelligence service cooperating with other intelligence services, so it's much more discreet. Um, the Algerians um, also provide uh, logistical support for efforts such as the international effort in Mali to uh, contain the Islamic militant threat there, also Niger. Um, I think the Algerians will not go somewhere where they're not invited. Um, they place a premium on uh, cooperation as opposed to sort of thrusting themselves into uh, other people's counterterrorism battles. Um, in that sense, they're relatively careful. So you have not seen, for example, the Algerian military undertake unilateral operations cross border, say, into Tunisia or into to Libya. Uh, it wouldn't really be the way the Algerian government operates. The U.S. have been ramping up their operations of the Sahel at the moment, boosting up capabilities in places like Mali and Niger. With this in mind, do you think Algeria is going to become even more important to the U.S. strategy for the Sahel now? I think um, Algeria, I don't know if it will be the most important, but it will be important simply because it is between Europe and uh, these Sahel areas where there is a, an Islamic extremist problem. And so if for no other reason than because Algeria provides overflight clearance for the Americans, um, that, that will be useful. The Algerians um, actually played this card, but not against the United States, but against France. Just in the last two weeks, um, in the wake of uh, remarks by French President Macron, which were critical of the Algerian government and the way it operates, uh, the uh, Algerians responded by blocking overflight clearances for French military flights connected to the ongoing French operations in the Sahel. The US also has a very close partnership with Morocco as well, as we discussed in our previous episode focusing on Western Sahara. The Western Sahara part of this story is very important. So in case you haven't checked that episode out yet, and to completely oversimplify and cram a 90 minute episode to 30 seconds, Western Sahara is a disputed territory on the west coast of Africa, just to the south of Morocco. At the end of the colonial period, the territory was supposed to have a referendum to either become an independent nation, the Arab Democratic Sahari Republic, a nation that would have very close cultural ties with Algeria, or to join Morocco and become part of the Moroccan kingdom. Before the native Sawaris were able to hold the referendum, though, the Moroccans marched hundreds of thousands of people into the territory to occupy it in a movement called the Green March. This kicked off a decades-long war between the Moroccans and the Sawaris. And today, Morocco is in charge of about 90% of the territory, with the Sawaris occupying about 10% of it, mostly a small strip along the desert. These days, most of the Sawaris are basing themselves out of Tindouf, in the southwestern corner of Algeria, rather than inside Western Sahara itself. This dispute has been a huge focus of domestic politics between Morocco and Algeria for decades now, and will continue to be a point of contention. So with tensions building up both in Western Sahara and on the border between Algeria and Morocco at the moment, will the US be forced to pick one side over the other eventually? So this is a really interesting question. The Trump administration made a big change in American policy with regards to the Western Sahara by recognizing uh, Moroccan uh, sovereignty over the Western Sahara, the disputed territory. 
And uh, prior to that, every administration, every American administration in Washington had studiously avoided that and simply said uh, there needs to be a resolution um, under a framework which the United Nations will devise, uh, avoiding thereby prejudging the outcome. Uh, the Trump administration did prejudge the outcome. The Algerians were very angry about that, but have not uh, gone so far as to block cooperation with the Americans on counterterrorism issues. The Biden administration in 2021 has not changed the Trump administration's recognition of Moroccan sovereignty. Uh, were Morocco and Algeria to come to blows, my sense is that Washington would look at this as a problem because Washington's interest is not the future of the Western Sahara, frankly. Uh, Washington's interest is uh, the terror threat in the region. Uh, and when I say the region, I mean southern Algeria, Mali, Niger, um, Burkina Faso, other places. And so uh, the Americans would want uh, to try to contain any conflict between Morocco and Algeria. They might offer their good offices. I don't know if Algeria would accept them since the Americans have prejudged the outcome of the Western Sahara. There might be a need for a different intermediary, whether that be the United Nations or uh, a country in Europe or another African state, for example. Um, it's not clear that the Americans would automatically be considered a fair uh, mediator by the Algerians in a dispute about the Western Sahara. With there being such a big issue inside of Algiers, why is Western Sahara so important to the Algerians? Is it What strategic gain does Algeria get from this? Uh, I have to tell you, I am puzzled by it myself, Michael. Um, when I went back to Algeria uh, as ambassador, in 2006, the, the worst of the violence of the Civil War was long past, and uh, I expected that the focus of the Algerian government in terms of foreign policy would be more on developing relations with uh, either African states or Europe and the United States or something. But the Western Sahara really does matter to the Algerian government, and I think it does for two reasons. Uh, number one, I think they really do view themselves as a competitor for influence in the region with Morocco. It's a bit odd because uh, in, in many ways, the two countries should have good relations. They could benefit a great deal, for example, by having open borders and trade. Uh, it would certainly facilitate investment into the region from outside. Um, there's a complementary of of economic issues. The Algerians have a lot of heavy industry and Moroccans much less. Oh, and I should mention that the Arabic dialects spoken in Morocco and Algeria are very similar um, and very different from Arabic dialects spoken in the Middle East. Um, but nonetheless, they're sort of enemy brothers, frère ennemi, we would say in French. And uh, there's just that rivalry. Second, and I think this does matter, it may sound trite to some of your listeners, but I think the Algerians really do believe that the people in the Western Sahara um, deserve a right of self-determination. Um, the, the Algerians relive their war of liberation against France almost daily. Uh, it is constantly in the media in Algeria, including the independent media, which is not taking its cues from the government. Um, it just matters to them. And so this question of self-determination for the Sahrawi people, I think matters to a lot of Algerians as a matter of principle. Of course, were they to gain independence someday, uh, which is a huge if, but were they to do so, uh, their links to Algeria would be very close, very, very firm, and that would help with this rivalry against Morocco that I was talking about before. And do you think the Algerians will continue to allow the Sahrawi fighters to base themselves out of Tindouf in Algeria for strikes into the Western Sahara indefinitely? I think there is no question that the, Alger the Algerians have decided to double down on support 
uh, for the uh, Republic of the Sahara. Um, I see no evidence to suggest that uh, they're going to, for example, um, uh, stop uh, cooperating on, uh, say, the refugee camps in um, the area around Tinduf. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, the, the Sahrawi leaders travel around on Algerian diplomatic passports. I've seen no evidence that the Algerians are going to take those away. They're, they're going to close the Sahrawi embassy, as they call it, in Algiers. Uh, just the opposite. Uh, their rhetorical support for the Sahrawis uh, is undiminished and maybe even stronger than it was five or ten years ago. Um, every time there is any kind of skirmish or uh, localized dispute uh, between the Sahrawis and or the, the Polisario fighters and the Moroccans, the Algerians consistently take the side of the Sahrawis, of the Polisario. Right now, though, the Algerians have some sort of a ticking clock at the moment, with the Algerian economy in a bad place and getting worse. Some say the cause of these economic problems is the lack of diversity in the economy. Some say it's the reduction in the demand for hydrocarbons. Others point to mismanagement and corruption. But what do you think are the causes of the faltering Algerian economy? Well, it's all of those things that you mentioned. But I think... Uh, the biggest problem with the Algerian business climate is that it's just, it's not transparent. And it's hard for foreign investors uh, to go uh, to a country like Algeria and take risks uh, in, were there a commercial dispute? And for example, Anadarko, an American oil company, has had disputes with the Algerian government, um, and they are usually not resolved according to uh, business law, uh, where commercial courts make decisions based on the law. Uh, there's a lot of negotiating, um, uh, there's a lot of influence exerted on Algerian courts. This is widely understood. Um, it's easier when a foreign company can get a, a, a guarantee from foreign government's investment agency, such as for the United States, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Uh, Bechtel made a gigantic investment in a water desalination plant in Algiers when I was ambassador there, but uh, much of their investment was underwritten, guaranteed, if you will, um, by the American government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And had that guarantee not been in place, I doubt Bechtel would have taken the risk of investing uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars in Algeria. Um, I, I used to emphasize this point to Algerians who would say we want foreign investment, we, we would like Americans to come here, you know, build things. And I used to say, well, the, the challenge you have is you have to be a more attractive business investment site than, say, countries in Southeast Asia or uh, countries in Southern Europe or Eastern Europe or Latin America. And you need to simplify your uh, business laws. You need to make them much more transparent and the, the arbitration process more transparent, commercial courts more transparent and faster. Uh, you need a whole set of systemic reforms. And I'm not even going into the corruption issues, Michael. That's a, another problem. With all these continuing issues, do you think we're likely to see another uprising in Algeria over the next few years? When I first was watching uh, on television these gigantic demonstrations in 2019 in Algiers and other cities, uh, not just Algiers, overall, uh, some of the cities up in the, the Kabili region, east of Algiers, uh, I worried that if the government tried to repress those demonstrations, uh, you could get violence again. I, I genuinely worried about it. However, I have to say I was wrong. Uh, the protest movement itself uh, is, is a lot smarter than maybe we all thought. Um, one of the reasons that the protest movement against the government at the start of the Civil War in 1992-93, one of the reasons it failed is it, it immediately became violent and it alienated with that violence a large segment of the Algerian population. 
And this time, uh, the Herak, the, the street protest movement, has been studiously nonviolent. I'm going to underline that to listeners. Studiously nonviolent. So that um, unlike what happened in, say, Syria, or unlike what happened, for example, in uh, Yemen or Libya, this big street protest movement never became violent, never had militias uh, spawn out of it and, um, and turn a peaceful protest into an armed conflict. I don't see any sign that the protest movement now, which is really heavily uh, repressed, but I haven't seen any sign that uh, its leadership, and its leadership is very segmented, but I haven't seen any sign that they, they're looking to violence. I think, if anything, the failure in places like Syria um, has given them even more reason to not be violent. With that in mind, though, how would you sum up the recent quite large purchases of arms and equipment made by Algeria? Are these arms designed for countering Islamic terrorism in the south or putting down protests in Algiers in the north? Or are they gearing up for a large-scale conflict with a border country like Morocco? What assumptions would you make about the recent large arms procurements by Algeria? Yeah, I, I don't think it's designed to repress the street protest movement. Um, you don't buy large aircraft systems to do that. Uh, it's it's much more about uh, the Algerian military updating its equipment um, and being considered more of a regional military power. Uh, this goes back again to this competition with Morocco. It's primarily aimed at Morocco and and the ability to to how would I say it? The ability to exercise influence in the region by having the capability, even if not the immediate intent, uh, to project armed force outside the country's borders. It's much less aimed at the domestic protest movement. They have um, quite a strong police and gendarmerie uh, that do that without calling in the regular army. They would use the army if it became violent. Um, we saw that clearly 30 years ago. It's the same government, essentially, so they'd do it again. But uh, I don't think that's what these arms purchases are aimed at. And what do you see for the future of Algeria? What do you think the big stories will be over the next two years? So the good news for the Algerian government is that uh, as world energy prices go, so goes Algeria's cash flow. And with uh, world oil and gas prices going way up, uh, so are Algerian government revenues. And so they will have more of a, how can I put it? They'll have more of a uh, cash account to draw upon to respond to um, isolated incidences of uh, protests and demonstrations and sort of um, buy off people at least for a short term. Um, it does not solve the underlying economic weaknesses, including this constant dependence on hydrocarbons exports. Um, it doesn't address the business climate issues that I was talking about before. And I have to say here, um, I, I, the Algerian public itself, um, maybe not unlike the Lebanese, um, took away a lesson from their really awful civil war in the 1990s, which is that um, everyone suffers when you have broad uh, widespread violence uh, and civil war like that. And so I don't think the political opposition is going to stop its criticism of the government. Um, but that's a very different thing from going from vocal criticism to armed opposition. Algeria has always been the nation to consistently stand as a beacon to many of its regional partners. Having thrown off the French so decisively, many nations like the Soviet Union looked to Algeria as a potential pillar of North Africa. Many saw the potential of an Algerian-led North and West Africa. But this is still yet to come to fruition. And Algeria has many problems to overcome. But can Algeria do it? Can Algeria overcome its internal problems and spread its influence throughout a region so often drowning in conflict? Or well, to answer that, 
we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Shifting Sands Algeria is a country that has been, I would say, very deeply impacted by its uh, war of national liberation in the 50s and 60s against the French occupation. That is, I would say, the event that has really defined the national identity of this country, its foreign policy, uh, and in general, its uh, worldview. That means specifically that Algeria and Algerians tend to be very focused on their national sovereignty. They're very, uh, I would say, aw uh, wary of uh, in external interferences. Ricardo Fabiani is a reporter and project director for the International Crisis Group specializing in North Africa and the Sahel. Ricardo has been at the forefront of reporting when it comes to this region, and we are very happy to have him back on the show today. There's a, a perception in Algeria uh, at the moment uh, that the, I would say, that the threats and the risks, uh, whether it's political security, uh, uh, you know, uh, asymmetrical, unconventional, that basically these threats uh, have increased over the past years. Uh, that obviously uh, this perception is particularly affected by, uh, on the one hand, obviously there is the decline uh, of the American presence, or let's say the partial uh, withdrawal of uh, the American presence in the region. But then there is also, on the other hand, the growing presence of other actors uh, in North Africa, uh, namely Turkey, Russia, uh, the UAE, as we have seen it <clears throat> in Libya. And then there is also, uh, this perception is also affected by Morocco's recent diplomatic normalization with Israel, which means that Rabat has now access to significant, you know, very, uh, I would say, advanced technology, uh, equipment uh, made by Israel that can be transferred to uh, Algeria's main, I would say, neighbor, but also main competitor in North Africa. So the, the this perception weighs a lot on the minds of the Algerian decision makers, whether it's we're talking about the political or the uh, military decision, decision makers. And obviously, in the Algerian context, this distinction uh, is often very, uh, uh, very hard uh, uh, to, to, to define. And uh, there is now a perception that Algeria needs to do something, that there, it's surrounded by uh, a growing number of threats, and they need to be prepared uh, for that. And in addition to all of this, there is a constitutional uh, reform that was approved last year uh, by the Algerian electorate. And this constitutional reform introduces for the first time the possibility for Algeria to send troops abroad. Um, and this is a very important development because for decades, Algeria refused the idea of intervening outside of its borders. Now it finally officially considers this possibility, takes this possibility into consideration. And what's happening in the Sahel, particularly in Mali, is a major source of concern for Algeria. So again, this is th there is nothing that has been decided yet, but there's also now this additional possibility that Algeria might send at some point its troops abroad in the Sahel region, for example, to stabilize it if the situation uh, deteriorates. Do you think these recent large purchases of equipment by the Algerian army signal that they're worried about a deterioration of relations between Algeria and Morocco and the potential for a conflict between the two nations? A potential war with Morocco would uh, automatically allow for external powers, external actors to interfere, to get involved uh, in this in this potential hypothetical uh, war. But they're also at the same time very worried about what's happening in Morocco and with Morocco. They're worried about obviously the resumption of hostilities between Morocco and the Polisario Front in the Western Sahara. But they're also worried, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, with the about the uh, normalization uh, deal uh, that uh, Morocco and Israel, 
uh, have ratified the fact that you know there was a visit by the Israeli foreign minister in Morocco only a few weeks ago. That more recently the Israeli defense minister has been talking about um, concluding a deal uh, on the, sa- the sale of drones uh, of Israeli drones to Morocco. The perception and I think the fear in Algeria right now is that uh, this uh, normalization with Israel plus uh, the conflict with, the, with the, the Polisario Front in the Western Sahara could tip the balance, the regional balance, in favor of Morocco, not necessarily now, but in the medium to long term. So Algeria right now is trying to send a very strong signal, very strong message to its neighbor that if they think they can get away with this, if they think they can just do whatever they want, impose their, you know, unilaterally impose their policy on Western Sahara, strike deals with Israelis, and so on and so forth, Algeria is ready to intervene, Algeria is ready to respond. But this is always from, I would say, a defensive uh, posture. There, there's never a, uh, an idea of necessarily intervening, for example, on behalf of the Polisario Front or liberating Western Sahara. This is obviously uh, impossible uh, from a political standpoint. But there is a readiness to respond and retaliate if Morocco were to go a little too far. Uh, now that it has the the support of Israel. Well, the Moroccans have been going out of their way to cozy up to the Israelis and the US and the French. So who are the Algerians getting close with? Who are Algeria's major partners in this conflict? So Russia is definitely the most important supplier uh, of weapons for Algeria, right? This is a a well-known fact. Algeria uh, has been for several years uh, the biggest uh, buyer of Russian weapons and, equip- and military equipment in the whole uh, of Africa. Um, and obviously, they still turn to Russia for whatever need, for whatever purchase they want to, uh, they want to make uh, in that field. But obviously, when it comes to uh, the, uh, let's say, ri- rivalry with Morocco, the situation is a bit more complex. Russia has no interests whatsoever in antagonizing Morocco. Russia has no interest whatsoever, most importantly, in getting too involved uh, in this um, conflict, in this dispute, let's say, between these two countries. Uh, The reason is simple. Moscow has interests in Morocco uh, as well, uh, economic interests, political interests, and they don't really want to uh, uh, necessarily side with Algeria or with Morocco uh, on this one. They prefer to hedge their bets. They prefer to keep their ties uh, with both sides. So uh, in this sense, I would say this is not necessarily a, a direct conflict where you have allies on the one hand uh, and enemies on the other. Uh, Algeria still has enjoys a very good relationship with the US. Uh, US officials visited uh, Algeria only uh, a few days ago. Uh, Algeria obviously has a very close relationship with France Obviously, it's not uh, an easy relationship, let's say. Uh, it's a relationship that is often uh, you know, fraught with uh, uh, misunderstandings and tensions and problems. And lately, we have seen Algeria obviously close its uh, airspace uh, to French military planes, which is obviously a major development. But at the same time, uh, these, two, these countries like France and the US cannot simply side with Morocco uh, against Algeria. They actually try to mediate, they try to pass messages and to, uh, I would say, reduce tensions between these two countries. So the picture, I would say, is more nuanced. But yes, Algeria cannot necessarily rely on a very strong ally uh, behind itself, cannot simply turn to, for example, Israel like Morocco does, but uh, it has a very uh, strong military uh, relationship with Russia and has very good diplomatic and political relations with France and the US. And that, in the Algerian perspective, from the Algerian perspective, that that is enough uh, uh, to make sure that the country is not isolated. After some semi-public comments French President Emmanuel Macron made about the Algerian government to a group of French Algerians, the government of Algeria has shut off the airspace over Algeria to all French planes and sternly criticized Macron and his government. Do you think this will have any impact on the French counterterrorism operations in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso now that their easiest flight path has just been cut off? Um, 
obviously it does matter for France because it makes uh, traveling, uh, you know, and sending planes to Mali uh, particularly complicated logistically. Um, from an from the Algerian perspective, however, there are two considerations here. The first one is that Algeria has never considered the French presence in Mali as a stabilizing force in the Sahel context. Actually, quite the opposite. For Algiers, France has been uh, a factor of instability uh, in the Sahel. The two countries have had uh, their misunderstandings and their uh, disagreements uh, when it comes to uh, Paris management of uh, you know relations with jihadist groups or extremist groups in the region, uh, its handling uh, uh, of the security situation in Mali and its handling of uh, diplomatic and military relations uh, with other countries uh, in the Sahel. And the other, the other point that uh, is very important for Algeria in this context is that uh, they are trying to send, uh, with the closing of the airspace, a very clear signal to France that they need to take Algeria's uh, viewpoint into consideration when it comes to their policies and their strategy uh, in the Sahel. And for months, there were rumors that uh, the Algerians and the French were talking about replacing uh, uh, French troops uh, in the Sahel with Algerian troops, or in any case, effectively Fran France uh, giving room uh, to Algeria to play a security role, a military role uh, in Mali and in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the rest of the region. These were only rumors. We never actually saw anything happen uh, after that, but I think they indicate a very simple fact that Algeria is thinking about playing a different role in the Sahel. They want France to acknowledge that Algeria is the major, the most important security partner when it comes to uh, this region. And they also want France to pay attention uh, very closely to the Algerian perspective uh, on all of that. So, yes, there is a price to pay for Algeria, of course, you know, making more difficult for France to, uh, you know, continue with its uh, projects and businesses in, in, in Mali. But at the same time, there is a, a, a much important, I would say, a very important reward or, or, or uh, expected reward from the Algerian perspective uh, in behaving this way. This new realm may throw a wrench in the plans for the Maghreb European gas pipeline, a pipeline designed to supply southern Europe with gas from North Africa. Putting aside this recent worsening of relations between Algeria and France, how likely do you think this plan would be to go ahead? I think the, 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 the biggest uh, concern or the biggest, let's say, um, variable right now when it comes to the, 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 the pipeline issues, because obviously we're talking about you know, on the one hand, Algeria uh, threatening to, to close the pipeline that goes through Morocco and reaches the I I Iberian Peninsula, and then replacing these volumes of natural gas uh, with uh, additional volumes through the pipeline that connects Algeria directly with Spain. Uh, this is right now in the current context, given in, you know higher, high and increasing. Uh, natural gas prices, it's inevitably, I would say, a factor and a source of preoccupation in Europe. Because any, I would say, a shock to the uh, current supply of natural gas to Europe, whether you know coming from Algeria or Russia or any other place, is uh, a source of concern given that the situation is already quite tense and demand is already uh, outstripping supply uh, at the moment uh, in Europe. But uh, if we look at the medium to long term, and if we take, uh, you know, for uh, if we take seriously Algeria's uh, promise that they can easily replace these lost volumes with additional volumes on this other pipeline, then for Europe actually there is nothing here to be afraid of. You know, that's obviously if Algeria uh, is uh, can be trusted on all of this. And the biggest problem is actually for Morocco because the uh, volumes of natural gas that were going through the pipeline, that were carried by the pipeline via Morocco to Europe, a part of them were actually uh, uh, supplied to uh, Morocco itself. And then now the question becomes, uh, Morocco 
losing uh, part of this natural gas and at the same time also losing some of the rights of passage, uh, some royalties that basically uh, Morocco was able to uh, profit from thanks to this uh, to this pipeline. So, yes, there is a there is obviously a risk in all of this um, for Europe, but the real impact, at least in the Algerians' calculations, is for Morocco. Now, obviously, there could be ways for Morocco to, uh, let's say, reduce the impact uh, of this decision. Uh, but again, we are still at a stage where it's not clear how far Algeria is willing to go. It's not clear uh, what alternatives there are. So I would say neither Algeria nor Morocco really knows um, what the future holds for, for them when it comes to natural gas. With the Libyan civil war still raging just over Algeria's eastern border, does Algeria have a preference on which side of the war they support? And do you think Algeria may get more involved in that conflict over the years? For Algeria, the uh, number one priority is the stabilization of Libya. And uh, they have actually been uh, very consistent in their position of neutrality uh, throughout the Libyan conflict since the very beginning. Algeria has never really had any interest in intervening uh, in Libya, whether openly or covertly. And the reason is very simple. Uh, up until last year, Algeria was not able, um, was not authorized by its own laws, by its own constitution to send troops abroad. Obviously, now this has changed, but that does not mean that Algeria right now is planning to send troops or send equipment into Libya. And from the German perspective, the reason is simple. They consider Again, external interference by uh, the US uh, and France to begin with, and then later on by the UAE, by Egypt, uh, by Turkey, by all these actors. They consider these interferences as the root of the problem in the Libyan context. From the Algerian perspective, these external actors, actors should actually cooperate, should work together and trying to find a sustainable compromise and solution uh, for Libya. And Algeria has actually offered several times uh, to mediate, to facilitate talks, uh, to uh, diffuse tensions. The only time when uh, the Algerian position was, uh, I would say, changed slightly, uh, and it almost appeared like um, the country was ready to support one side against the other, was when uh, um, Field Marshal uh, Khalifa Haftar was laying siege on the capital, uh, the Libyan capital of Tripoli, and he was close to taking over the whole country. Now, it was clear at the time that Algeria was not enthusiastic about after unifying the country, taking it over militarily with the support of Egypt uh, uh, and the UAE. Uh, and probably there was the concern in Algeria that having a, such a close uh, pro-Egyptian ally uh, at, it, at their borders was not a great idea. They preferred Libya to be a, some sort of buffer between Algeria uh, and Egypt. And at that time, Algeria, let's say that gave a, gave a yellow light, let's put it this way, to Turkey to intervene and send troops to rescue the government in Tripoli uh, uh, and push back after. So at that moment, I would say, you know, whether... And regardless of the fact that Algeria remained neutral officially in the conflict, at that time it was quite clear that Algeria was looking at the Turkish intervention with a degree of sympathy, if we can put it that way. But outside of that moment, Algeria has always been, uh, has always had the same position, which is support for the stabilization of Libya, the reunification of Libya, and uh, a very stern opposition to any uh, external interference, military interference, and obviously no e idea, no interest whatsoever in intervening directly in the Libyan conflict. As we've discussed with some of our previous guests, a lot of the problems Algeria has stem from its economic instability. Is there anything the country can really do at the moment to actually fix these problems? So I would say this is the biggest uh, question and the most important question, and uh, nobody really has an answer um, to this very important problem. Uh, this, uh, the, the economic uh, issue, the economic problems of Algeria have been uh, at the forefront of every conversation on Algeria, whether externally, 
abroad or, or, or domestically inside Algeria. Um, it's clear, obvious to everyone who's, who's following Algeria, who knows a little bit of Algeria, that the current economic arrangement, current economic setup is unsustainable in the medium to long term. Algeria is a country that exports almost exclusively uh, hydrocarbons, uh, does not produce anything else. And it's entirely dependent on uh, oil uh, and gas prices for the rest of the economy, for you know, to pay salaries, to buy uh, goods from abroad. Uh, and when we talk about goods from abroad, we're talking about even basic items uh, such as you know cereals and and uh, you know whatever you need effectively to feed uh, a family in the country. And with the energy transition uh, that has already started. And with obviously fluctuating oil and gas prices, the biggest risk and the biggest problem for Algeria is that uh, right now they can breathe because uh, gas prices have recovered, oil, gas, oil prices have recovered. So they have a little bit of you know, a fiscal room for maneuver to uh, pay off effectively the various constituencies in Algerian society and to make sure that they are uh, more or less happy with the status quo. But uh, what happens in the medium to long term when uh, oil and gas will not play the same central role in the global economy or when Algeria itself will actually risk actually to run, off the run out uh, of oil and gas reserves? That's the biggest question that nobody has an answer for simply because the government has, been, uh, has announced a series of economic reforms that are actually the same economic reforms that have been announced at regular intervals over the previous, uh, over the past 10, 15 years. Every government comes in and talks about uh, opening up the economy, attracting foreign investment, uh, liberalizing uh, the economy, reducing red tape, making sure that the non-oil economy uh, is able to thrive. But nobody does anything actually about it. Why? Because there is a I would say, a coalition of vested interests in the public administration, in the army, even in the business sector, which is a crony, effectively, uh, business class that relies on uh, the redistribution of uh, benefits and privileges by the government. No one really wants to see reform. Reform uh, can unsettle and destabilize the country. And the government is very well aware that changing the current economic arrangement means uh, putting at risk the stability of the country. So the best strategy is to just wait and uh, postpone any difficult and uh, uh, unpopular decision. And that's what's happening right now. We are hearing a lot of announcements, a lot of talk about change, but we are still waiting to see any concrete evidence that this time the government uh, means business. Obviously, I could be wrong. Obviously, this time... They might be forced by uh, a reckoning uh, that uh, they have to do this. They have to introduce these this, this reforms. But uh, I remain skeptical because I've seen too many times Algerian uh, uh, leaders announce changes that never took place. Morocco has been blaming Algeria at the moment for all sorts of things, including harboring terrorists, spying, and even accusing Algeria of lighting bushfires inside Morocco. At this point, most of it's just rhetoric. But do you think there's a risk of this lurching out of control and the beginning open hostilities between Algeria and Morocco over the next few months or years? I, I would say this is the biggest uh, risk, the biggest uh, threat to regional stability at the moment. Algeria and Morocco uh, effectively losing control of this uh, a war of words that they're currently waging uh, against each other. Um, obviously, you know, this is uh, a relationship that has uh, been difficult uh, for decades. Uh, we are not discovering now that Morocco and Algeria uh, don't like each other and have uh, a very tense relationship and tend to disagree on many issues from uh, Western Sahara uh, to the relationship with France and the US and so on. But what has changed now is that uh, there is a perception in Algeria that they, do, they need to do something to make clear to Morocco and its allies that uh, Algeria's uh, concerns and Algeria's preoccupations in the regions need to be listened to. Uh, and 
that uh, there is a balance of power in the region that should remain uh, unchanged. And I think this is the biggest concern that Algeria uh, has, that basically Morocco could become a much stronger, uh, let's say, neighbor than it currently is, and much stronger than Algeria itself, of course. So uh, the, we have seen over the past weeks uh, uh, a series of provocations and uh, measures and retaliations that uh, both sides have introduced against each other, particularly Algeria, of course, closing the airspace to Moroccan planes and mobilizing part of its army uh, near the border uh, with Morocco, obviously continuing to support the Polisario Front in its uh, low-intensity war against Morocco and suspending diplomatic ties uh, between the two countries. Obviously, this is still well within the limits of what is acceptable in diplomatic and political terms. But the problem and the, the risk here is that uh, Morocco will just continue to develop uh, its uh, the relationship with Israel, will not um, you know, just bow down to Algerian pressure on Western Sahara, and that at some point Algeria will be in a position where they will have to do something else, to continue to make clear to the international community and Morocco that uh, the situation uh, is not okay and that they need to do something. So at some point, the, but the fear that I have is that Algeria might just go a little bit too far and push Morocco into, uh, uh, basically force Morocco to retaliate even further. So they could lose control of this dynamic and we could end up with some sort of low intensity or small scale conflict. The possibility is there and it has increased over the, the, the previous weeks. So at this point, both sides are doing what they can to avoid lighting the powder kegs. Simply knowing that the end results would be devastating for both sides. This would not be an easy victory for either one of them, and both Rabat and Algiers are acutely aware that any further destabilization may simply open the door to nastier and more radical actors taking the reins of power in their home capitals. It is in the interest of not only these two, but all of the major counterterrorism fighters like the US, the UK, and France to do what they can to pull this situation back from the brink, to make sure nobody is playing with matches around the powder keg of North Africa. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been another big month here at the Red Line for us with our fourth geopolitics pub quiz, our Red Line Hearts of Iron game, and the crossing of 3 million streams last week. So thank you to everyone who keeps tuning into the show. If you want to hear more about these events and get involved, you can find links and info as well as great articles we put out on top of these on our Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, and Discord on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to find me on Twitter and give me a message, you can find me on the handle at MyKilliadOz, Oz is in Australia. Or simply visit our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. As just a small token of our appreciation, we are also reading out our latest Patreon's name who signed up at the time of recording. So a big thanks goes out to Jerry Horwood, who is our latest Patreon. The show would not be possible without the support of our amazing patrons just like Jerry, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep this show going. Our patrons get to join in on games nights and live Q&As and get extra materials for the show. I also regularly meet up with Patreons one-on-one -on -one to answer any questions you might have or get behind the scenes look at how we run the show. If you're an existing Patreon as well, or you donated to the show previously, you can now also check our website as we have as we have dedicated individual episodes to each of our Patreons. I really cannot thank our Patreons that we have nearly enough for their support. And if you feel like you can spare a couple of dollars a week, we really would appreciate it. But most importantly, this episode is dedicated to Jerry as well as our new signups from this fortnight, which you can check out on our website. As usual, here are our three book recommendations if you want to take the subject further. The first is Algeria, Anger of the Dispossessed by John Phillips and Martin Evans on how the Algerian civil war and liberation struggle is still incredibly prevalent today. The second is Politics and Power in the Maghreb, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco from independence to the Arab Spring for a historical context of the region. And the last is Mecca of Revolution, Algeria, Decolonization, and the Third World Order. 
to explain just how much Algeria influences the direction of the North African region. I want to thank our guests this week, Jalal Hachari, Robert S. Ford, and Ricardo Fabiani. All of you were fantastic to work with on this one, with a few of you making multiple appearances on the show. We look forward to having you all back on the show very soon. I want to thank my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zivella, research assistants for writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. All of you are fantastic to work with on this project, and all your research and work that went into the Algeria piece came out incredibly. I'm really proud of the entire team on this one. My last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. I know I say it a lot, but I really am blown away by the amazing friends and community that have been built up around this show. I love hanging out and chatting with all of you at our events or on our Discord, and I'm just so proud of what this has all become. So once again, a huge thanks from both myself and the entire team. The show will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit the redlinepodcast.com.